This is a production of Cornell University. Frustrated that their university students arrive unable to think, Dr. Laura Colosi of the College of Human Ecology's Family Life and Development Center at Cornell University and Dr. Derek Cabrera of the Research Institute for Thinking and Education set out on a journey to change schools by bringing the results of their research into the real-world classroom environment. The book, Thinking at Every Desk, is a snapshot of their continued work with educators and schools across America. At a Chat in the Stacks book talk at Mann Library, Doctors Colosi and Cabrera discussed some of the major themes of their book to highlight guidelines for the Patterns of Thinking method. Four simple thinking skills that will have a ripple effect on everything educators do and provide students from pre-K to Ph.D. essential tools needed for success in the 21st century. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Oaks. I'm the director of Mann Library. And this is our first Chats in the Stacks <laughs> book talk of the semester. And I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Um, our speakers are Dr. Derek Cabrera and Dr. Laura Colosi, who are discussing their new book, Thinking at Every Desk, uh, Four Simple Thinking Skills That Will Transform Your Teaching, Classroom, School, and District. And hopefully all those students out at the desks are listening <laughs> through the door. Um, Dr. Cabrera is an internationally recognized expert in thinking skills and metacognition. He's a senior faculty at the Research Institute for Thinking in Education and president and founder of ThinkWorks. He holds a PhD from Cornell University and has served on the faculty at Cornell where he taught a graduate level course on systems thinking. And Dr. Colosi is a well-known educator, evaluator, and expert in research methods with a focus on assessing educational outreach programs. She currently holds a senior research appointment at Cornell's Family Life Development Center and is CEO of ThinkWorks. Dr. Colosi holds a PhD in Policy Analysis and Management from Cornell, along with a master's and a bachelor's degree also from Cornell. <laughs> That's a good thing. I write big checks every month. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so please welcome our speakers and we'll hear about their book. We, um, we were very excited to talk about the book. We had at first prepared a lovely, beautiful PowerPoint slideshow for you and decided rather we would try to be more conversational and intimate and talk to you through some selected passages which we'll read through the, from the book and then also have a lot of time for comments and discussion as we sort of go through it. So without further ado, we'll start. <laughs> All right. So, uh, my family dinner table was my alma mater. It's the place I learned to love the pursuit of knowledge. It's the place I learned to think. My mother's only hard and fast rule was that we all had to be at the dinner table every night. Each night we talked about everything under the sun, from the silly to the serious, what we did at school that day, squabbles with my siblings, current events, politics, science, religion, anything. We played with our food. In fact, we were encouraged to do so. My father had this strange habit of using anything on the table, food, salt, and pepper shakers, forks, knives, napkins, and even the plates, to represent any idea he was explaining in whatever topic we were discussing. Dad, what do they mean by Reaganomics? Reaganomics is a portmanteau, he'd say, a word that fuses President Reagan and economics, squishing two chunks of soft bread together. Then he shaped the new piece of bread into a bowl and held it out for us to see. He continued, Reaganomics has four key components, and he dropped a piece of diced chicken into the bread bowl as he listed each one. Reduction of government spending, regulation, taxation, and inflation. And so it continued every night. Dad, what's regulation mean? Well, if you take this large spoon and this small spoon and scoop rice from the bowl, you'll see that the structure of the spoon, its size, regulates the amount of rice that blah, blah, blah. And so it went every night at dinner time. These early experiences had great effect on me. And first, it became virtually impossible for me to eat at my friends' houses. <coughs> More importantly, adopting my father's habit gave me an eye, a feel, and a love for ideas themselves that led me to the formal study of how we create them. 
It gave me an eye for ideas because I could actually see ideas on the table, literally. They were no longer entangled up in my head. They were right on the table in front of me, visible, tangible. It gave me a feel for ideas. I could hold any idea in my hand, manipulate it, move it around, and combine it with others. I could take an idea from my brother, change it, add or subtract from it, and hand it back to him. Ideas were literally and figuratively tangible. It gave me a great love of ideas. They were to be played with, constructed, combined, interrelated, explored. The world of ideas became my favorite playground. Knowledge became my muse. While other kids were building skyscrapers and dinosaurs, I was building ideas. I became fascinated early on with how do we make ideas and how we are able to share them with others. This led to more than 15 years of formal research into the process of constructing ideas among any and all learners. This process is the crux of education. My father's habit taught me how to construct and deconstruct knowledge. I learned to distinguish and differentiate, idea, I, differentiate ideas, to break ideas into parts or merge them into holes, to make connections between and among ideas, and to consider things from different points of view. In short, I learned to think. In this book, my colleague, Laura Colosi, and I explain the implications of my research into thinking. You will learn some of what we've learned about how thinking works and how thinking skills can be taught as a result of our understanding of how knowledge itself is structured. So this next passage is from a section entitled, Restoring the Balance, What to Know and How to Know. We build knowledge. Knowledge changes. These two laws apply to all knowledge, every subject area, every fact, every idea that ever was and ever will be. They also create an interesting dilemma for our teachers. If what we teach today may change over time, even become invalid or irrelevant, what will our students do as they enter the real world? What will people need to survive in a world where many of the facts they've learned don't survive and the only way to get new knowledge is to think? The answer is simple. We must equip our students to approach any new knowledge by teaching them not only what to know, content knowledge, but also how to know, thinking skills. Content knowledge and thinking skills must be taught in balance. Yet again, when we look at our schools, we see a dangerous imbalance. We see a mismatch between our practices and reality. We, we see a system that behaves as if students can get knowledge and teachers can give it. However, we know that knowledge is built. We see a system that behaves as if facts are static and reliable forever. However, we know that knowledge is constantly changing. We see a system that behaves as if knowledge can be segregated from thinking. However, we know that the two are in an inseparable and dynamic cycle. In sum, our schools are using an industrial age mindset to train students for the knowledge age. If we continue on this path, every American child will be left behind. Perhaps most importantly in today's information age, thinking skills are viewed as crucial for educated persons to cope with a rapidly changing world. Many educators believe that specific knowledge will not be as important to tomorrow's workers and citizens as the ability to learn and make sense of new information. We need citizens who not only know things, but can also think. That is, people who can create new knowledge to solve novel problems. Yet both by commission, overemphasizing content-based curriculum, and by omission, failing to teach them thinking skills, we're letting our students down. We must not only teach them what to know, but also how to think so that they can create new knowledge when the knowledge they have isn't working. We must develop both content knowledge and robust thinking skills in every student. Instead, we focus almost entirely on content knowledge, testing, memorization, and recall. We seem to believe that children will learn to think on their own, that if we just keep teaching them more and more stuff, they will magically, miraculously, somehow, some way, learn to think along the way. It reminds us of one of our favorite cartoons. We don't need a miracle, we need a method. We need an explicit method for teaching thinking skills that really works that simplifies teaching and enables any student from pre-K to PhD to think. The cartoon is the, and then a miracle occurs, golden spike kind of thing I'm sure most of you are familiar with. 
This book provides an explicit method based on four simple rules that underlie the process of creating knowledge. These four rules are simple, sublime, universal, and accessible. Once you learn these four rules, you will find that they can be used at every moment with every student in every subject area at every grade. In fact, as you learn more about these simple rules, you will see that their utility transcends the arena of teaching and education and permeates into every aspect of life. Sure, the four simple rules will transform the way you teach and the way your students learn, but they can also transform the way you live. The rules will help you and your students develop their metacognition or thinking about their thinking. They will provide students with a universal scaffold upon which they build all of their knowledge, access their prior knowledge, and construct new meaning of content throughout their educational experience. A greater implication is that this holds true for every student, regardless of ability, socioeconomic background, language, special needs, or age. The four simple rules apply to every grade, every lesson, every subject, and every student. From the students' earliest days of watching Sesame Street to the moment when they walk across a university stage to receive their doctorate, these rules will equip your students with all they need to move up in grade level, think through any problem, understand each subject, and prepare them for a certain future in an uncertain, fast-paced, and ever-changing world. When our graduates are armed with a powerful method of thinking, known as the patterns of thinking, they will know how to do what today's graduates cannot. They will know how to think through anything, especially unstructured tasks they will face in whatever vocation they choose. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite uh, quotes from F. Scott Fitzgerald. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Research conducted with college students from both Kyoto, Japan, and Michigan demonstrates the significant differences between Eastern and Western styles of thought. Students were shown videos depicting an underwater scene that contained fast and slow fish, water, bubbles, plant life, rocks, and so on. Japanese and American students described the scene quite differently. While both mentioned the fish, or the identity, equally, Japanese students also mentioned background components, or the other, 60% more often than, um, than the Americans did. Japanese students also mentioned the hidden relationships with surrounding objects, the fish wove through the grasses, twice as often. The study also noted that Japanese students spoke first of the environment, it's a scene in a pond, while American students first mentioned the fish. The study concluded that Asians see the big picture and they see objects in relation to their environments, so much so that it can be difficult for them to visually separate objects from their environments. Westerners focus on objects while slight, sliding the field, and they literally see fewer objects and relationships in the environment than do Asians. It's tempting to conclude that one thought style is better than the other, but the truth is that the 21st century calls for both types of thinking. Thinking that helps us see, to see both the identity and the other, to see the hidden connections, to zoom in and to zoom out, to split and to lump, to take various perspectives. In short, the 21st century thinker needs to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain that ability to function. Our legal system, guilty, not guilty, technology, ones and zeros, and worldview, us and them, to name a few, are all based on bivalency, the either-or logic of Aristotle, true and false. When we consider the 21st century thinking skills we need in order to navigate effectively within our increasingly interconnected planet, it behooves us to expand our vision in both the macro and the micro. It's the power of multivalency, or and both. The power of the patterns of thinking method, which is the method described in this book, is the power of and both. The four patterns allow us to create definitive boundaries in one moment and challenge those boundaries in the next. In the end, we hold both in full view. The implications of this multivalent, or and both, thinking cannot be underestimated. With and both, we can create mental models that are more accurate to the real world. In short, mental models that are, out, that are out of alignment with the real world are useless. Mental models that are in alignment with the real world can be used to navigate and change it. Yeah. Oh, am I going again? Yeah, you took my turn. I did? <laughs> did I just read your passage? Go. We'll pick it back still up. still haven't learned to think. <laughs> that was you? Oh, boy. 
I what sounded great, now? didn't I? Yeah, that was good. My You're voice good is getting deeper. I can project. So I'm doing this one now? Yes. Okay. Goodness gracious. This is confusing. <laughs> so this is actually my favorite passage in the book. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm not pulling your leg. I'm writing these words for this paragraph and a few of the others on July 4th. I'm sitting in my backyard. I need to take a shower and get ready for a big barbecue. Earlier, as I do each year, I read the Declaration of Independence, a refresher. It's a remarkable document. One can imagine the Founding Fathers knew they were in for a fight when they wrote it. They were thinkers, not warmongers, but they, they were fed up. In the Declaration of Independence, when the term United States of America is used, the writers did not capitalize the word united as we do today. It was an adjective that described the states of America rather than part of the proper noun it is today. But, re what, really re but what really unites us as Americans, what makes me feel a sense of patriotism, are the ideas expounded upon in a small paragraph in the Declaration. I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's a powerful concept, and it's as American as it gets. But here's the point, and I get chills as I write it. If the governed are not thinking, then their consent is meaningless. Thinking is as patriotic and American as apple pie. Should I do this now? No. no. What do I do now? Just shut up. Okay, this is from a section called Thinking at Every Desk. Old Kirk Christensen, a carpenter, founded Lego in 1932. At the time, he was out of work because of the Depression and decided to build wooden toys, piggy banks, etc., in Denmark. In 1947, he got samples of a plastic brick invented and patented called Self-Locking Building Bricks by Mr. Hillary Harry Fisher Page in Britain. And, be, and he began creating the automatic binding bricks, which we know today as Lego bricks, a name that originated in 1953. Today, Lego, with headquarters in Billund, Denmark, is the sixth largest toy company in the world, with over 5,000 employees and revenue of $7.8 billion, I'm sorry, billion Danish kroner. I'm losing my sight here. When we were kids, Lego building bricks came in a big bucket. You could build anything. In fact, the 1958 Lego patent, number 3005282, states, quote, the principal object of the invention is to provide for a vast variety of combinations of the bricks for making toy structures of many different kinds and shapes. And that was the magic of Lego. Anything you could imagine, you could build. Every kid could unleash his creativity on the world. Children today may never know the joy of unbridled creativity. Licensing has become one of the toy industry's most lucrative venues, and LEGO is no exception. Inundated with over 130 new licensed LEGO kits per year, children can choose among Thomas and Friends, Bob the Builder, Batman, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, SpongeBob SquarePants, only to be guided by step-by-step -step instructions using the same amount of creativity needed to read a VCR manual. In contrast to the unbounded play mentioned in the original patent, these licensed kits only allow children to build pre-designed structures. This is not to say that LEGO's new licensed products lack creativity. Indeed, the designer's desk at LEGO's headquarters are teeming with creative ideas. Perhaps for profit or consumer demand, LEGO has changed its business strategy. But the net effect for children around the world is that was what was once open to imagination is now closed by instruction. The physical, the physical construction is now scripted, robbing children of the cognitive construction that was once the point. The result is that the creativity and construction that once filled the hands and minds of children everywhere now rests at a corporate desk in Denmark. Here's our fear, that educators, teachers, curriculum designers and others 
all with the best of intentions, are doing an analogous thing in preparing content for classroom consumption. We're surgically removing the messy constructions. Thinking happens, but it happens at the wrong desk. It needs to happen at the student's desk. The Lego story serves as a poignant reminder to curriculum designers and teachers everywhere. When we overprepare for the class, we are robbing our students of the opportunity to build their own ideas. We must ensure that the construction happens at the right desk, not the teacher's or the curriculum designer's desk. Without thinking at every student's desk, your graduates will not be invited to sit at the tables of the future. That's you. What, six? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, this is about uh, 21st century thinking. We live in a fast-paced, globalized world where knowledge is growing and changing at a rate we can't keep up with. Our schools need to prepare students for jobs that don't exist that will use technology not yet invented to solve unknown problems in a society we can only imagine. In this 21st century, students need not only to know the content knowledge covered in schools, they also will need to know how to think. As research scientists, educators, entrepreneurs, and Americans, we've seen the need for thinking skills all around us, from preschool to middle school, from high school to college, from business leaders to world leaders. Today's students can ace any test, but lack the ability to do the unstructured tasks that are so common in the real world. Thinking is not important just in schools, but also for our businesses and our country as a whole. Thinking is, as we said, patriotic. It lies at the core of our workforce and competitive advantage and our democracy. In 2006, as colleagues at Cornell University, Laura Colosi and I decided to do something about the problems we face educationally and in the world at large. We decided to do something few academics rarely do, to put our ivory tower research to work in the real world. We started a small organization with a big vision thinking at every desk. Our vision is that every American student learns to think. That's every student in every grade and every subject. We hope you'll join us in our vision to bring thinking skills to every student, school, and district in America. Start simple by bringing thinking skills to the desks you have influence over. If you're a classroom teacher, that might be 20 or 30 students each year. If you're a principal or superintendent, you have the influence to bring thinking skills to many more desks. But if you are just one person, bring thinking skills into your own life. We only need one desk at a time to make a difference. So that really led to, uh, to uh, a, I guess, what was that, 2006. So it's been five, almost five years, is that right? Uh, kind of a whirlwind in terms of what we've been doing ever since. And uh, <laughs> we've been traveling around the world and around the country uh, teaching. We didn't read too much about the method. That's sort of the, the meat of the book. Um, uh, which is these four patterns of thinking. And uh, we're teaching those to teachers around the country. We're seeing these, um, these patterns being taught to Head Start kids, little kids, uh, at the same time that they're, they're taught to doctoral students in universities. The same exact patterns and the same tools are being used uh, by little kids and big kids. Uh, it doesn't matter really what topic they're in because they're, these patterns were derived from structures in knowledge. It doesn't matter whether you're teaching mathematics or history. Um, these kids are learning cognitive, metacognitive skills that underlie the content that allows them to bridge the content and do interdisciplinary things as well. So th that's kind of been our, our fun experience and uh, we didn't really plan on any of this happening but uh, that's what's happened. Do you want to? follow up and then we can kind of just open it up and have a conversation about thinking and education. Why don't we just open it up? Yeah. See what you have. Yes. Could you tell us these four skills? Yeah. <laughs> we were anticipating that question. <laughs> they're sort of hidden in the text of what we read. We actually read a few of them, but they're, they're not, in, not in the way they are in the book. Which there's one chapter for each of the four. It, the, I call the theory the DSRP theory. And that stands for distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And um, this is a, you know, this is a pretty. Um, I taught a course here uh, at Cornell for grad students on this theory, and uh, you know, it takes a, it took us 16 weeks getting through the, the methodology and the theory and all that kind of stuff with grad students. So it's, it's a fairly deep theory, um, but it's also a theory that can be used by little kids, uh, you know, to learn basic thinking skills that 
that evolve all the way up, like I said, to grad school or beyond. So the, the theory is made up of these four patterns. Each pattern has two elements, and then there's some real um, uh, formalized dynamics between them that, uh, you know, how they operate between them. So for example, if you think about distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives, you can imagine um, you can have a pre-K uh, child learning the difference between colors or learning the difference between seasons or something like that. And that involves making distinctions between and among those ideas, recognizing them as part of a system of the climate and all of those things, and um, maybe relating their daily activities to each season. This is what I do. I bring it down to the classroom. So this is, this is the way it's going to be for a while. And you know, taking many different perspectives of you know, what, what do I think about this season? What does, for example, an umbrella think about this? So they, they play with multiple perspectives. Well, you can, you can fast forward those same four things. And you'll see distinction systems, relationships, and perspectives when a graduate student is, for example, learning 21 different ways to catalog species in some specific science area. So the point is that these four thinking skills will, uh, will sort of be like a, a, a backpack that students can take throughout their life and apply in any content. It's just that the sophistication of the content that they're working with will increase as they get older. I don't know if that helps as well. But. Systems. Um, so, for example, when we when we uh, when we create any idea, in order to create an idea, uh, I'm getting, I, I tend to be more theoretical, <laughs> and she kind of translates. I pull so, on the balloon string. So maybe we can do both, and then for the theoretical people, <laughs> you'll enjoy that, and then for the uh, more pragmatic people, uh, you'll enjoy that. So, so w in order to create any idea, and I mean literally, sort of at that quantum level, just to, to recognize a you know a light or carpet or anything, whether that whether it be something as basic as that or something like you know as complex as theory of relativity or Darwinian evolution or something like that. In order to create any idea, we have to distinguish between the identity of the idea and the, the not idea, the other. And in so doing, that idea already has part whole structure, and that's what we mean by system. System is just uh, the pattern for part whole structure. You have part whole structure in every idea. Um, and did you say part whole? Part whole structure, yes. Part whole structure is, is universal. Is it part of a whole that or a whole part or a thought? That, that there are and parts that make oh, up part holes, whole. and yeah, that yeah. holes are made up of parts, and that a whole can be a part of a larger whole, and that parts can be a whole for smaller parts. Okay, yeah. Thank it's you. Sort of universal structure. Yeah. You can't have an idea without that structure, and and as you get into more and more complex ideas, those structures, for example. The simple interrelationship of part whole can create things like hierarchy, taxonomies, categories. So these things lie beneath things that we think are basic in cognitive science, like categories. We believe today in, co in cognitive science that a category is a very basic construction. And it's actually quite far above the most basic constructions. What you need for categorization is part whole and perspective taking. And if you think about this, you know, just sort of basically, you take a bunch of buttons or you take a bunch of, spe a bu a bunch of uh, animals, organisms, and you try to categorize them. You can categorize them into species or you categorize the buttons by some, by some way of uh, organizing them, right? In order to organize them, you, you're essentially grouping them into part-whole groups, right? But you're doing that from a perspective. So I give you a thousand buttons and you organize them perhaps by color. The perspective that you're doing that, organi that part-whole whole organization from is color. And it turns out, believe it or not, that while we teach in the, uh, in the schools today, we teach sort of uh, kings play chess on Friday, generally speaking, the, you know, the, the, the basic kingdom, phylum, species, gen genus, all that. Um, we see that as the basic way that we organize species. But systematists, uh, biologists, use 21 different perspectives to organize species, depending on the way that they, that they, that the, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to understand. So it turns out that categories are actually a little bit like a cul-de-sac, even though we think they're quite universal. They're not. They're a cul-de-sac in our thinking because they make us think that things are quite finite and structured when really they're quite dynamic. We're using perspectives to shift our part-whole structures. 
Does that make sense? So, and that's happening very quickly. We can shift our part whole structures just when we shift the perspective. We can shift the entire collection. And that's what, at a very high level, systematists are doing in 21 different ways. They're organizing all the species in 21 different perspectival ways into different groupings. And this becomes very important when you're dealing with things like bacteria, et cetera. And little kids are doing this when they're organizing the, you know, the part whole structure of the front of the fire truck from the back of the fire truck. And then they go and build that with boxes. And the way that they structure it is that part whole structure. Well, what those little kids are doing at a young age actually is the same part whole cognitive structure that world class systematists are doing here at Cornell. And there's really no difference. The only difference is that the content is getting slightly more sophisticated as we go. The underlying structures are quite simple. So that's an example. And there's four of these structures, and they interact in a very complex way. Uh, it's actually a complex adaptive system, if, if that's a, a field that anyone's familiar with, where you have complex uh, things emerge complexly out of very, very, very simple rules. So, uh, if you want to. <laughs> I tried to be talk about little kids. <laughs> I was really struck by your first, or maybe it was the first or second passage you quoted about your father and the spoons and rice and the dinner table being very visual and dynamic. And I work with technology and I see many possibilities for visualization yes. and idea management and complex ideas. Yes. Does your book or any of your practice work with visualization? Because yeah. I can't, I, I'm dying to see things when we you're do. talking yeah. about this. We work this. with two things and we actually brought them. Um, there's a, uh, the newest issue of Scientific American Mind has an article uh, that we did that talks about the research behind tactile manipulatives and why it's so absolutely crucial that we get tactile manipulatives back into not just the little kids, but the big kids. And Watson and Crick will confirm this, because Watson and Crick have stated time and time, Watson and Crick who sort of founded DNA, they didn't found it, it wasn't a company, but you know, they discovered it. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they've said time and time again that they wouldn't have been able to do it if they couldn't sort of model it physically. And kids need this too, but so do adults. And so we developed a, a tool which um, is called Think Blocks and also a method that's called DSRP diagramming. And we, this is what we use with kids and this is what uh, we have doctoral students that build, literally build structure their dissertations on these structures. And it, this is a DSRP block. So for example, this is just breaking down a phrase from William Shakespeare, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, they have their exits and their entrances from you. as you like it. Yeah. Might be useful to say the physical structures of the block that correlate with Oh the, yeah, I could um, do that. Start small yes. and go bigger. So so these blocks, to answer your question, are the tactile version and then there's this yeah. visual version which I'll show you in a second. And each block is, it's a fractal. So each block has distinction, meaning it, it, it's its own identity and it relates to everything else in the conceptual space as the other. Um, it has distinction because it has blockiness, right? The, the, this block is not the other block. This idea is not the other idea. And this is a big, a fundamentally important problem with uh, people's thinking is you have to really distinguish ideas. I mean, that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, a lot of what we do in science is to distinguish things. Um, then, of course, you have part whole structures, right? So the, 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 the idea, literally the, the idea that they're dry erasable, so you can write on them, and they can have part whole structures. So you can put parts in them, right? Kids love doing that too. But it's not just a kid's toy, we use it all the time. And then they're magnetic, so you can relate things together. So you can see these two are being related by, by these two things are being related by this one. And then they also have this little window thing, so they can be, every idea in the system can be its own perspective. And a lot of people think of perspectives as uniquely human or people things or, or things that have eyes and ears. But you can actually take perspectives from ideas. So these are just little bundles of neurons looking at other bundles of neurons. And um, so, for example, you can, I, there was a paper that I read the other day that war from an evolutionary perspective. Well, there's no people in that. There's just the concept of war being looked at, being analyzed by, from, the, from the, all the sort of part whole structures of what evolution is. And, and so, you know, this is how ideas form. So in any case, those are what the blocks do. And so we build this thing. And you can see, for example, that what, what Shakespeare was saying is that the world is a stage. He was literally saying that it is a stage. So he's making a metaphor. 
And so we see common structure here even with these words. But we can change the words a little bit and show that he wasn't actually making a simile. But notice the common structure. We have these two things, and they're related. We change the content, and we can see a simile. So we just built the metaphor, and then we built the simile. And you can clearly see the distinction between it. And then inside of that metaphor, what Shakespeare did quite remarkably, that's why Shakespeare is pretty remarkable, is he's very poetic. But there, there's tremendous underlying structure and uh, analytical structure to it. Then he made these two analogies inside the metaphor. Um, and so this is, this is an analogy, a physical built analogy. So men and women are to birth and death as players are to entrances and exits. And men and women are to the world as players are to the stage. And so this is a physical model of this um, Shakespearean, uh, these lines in, the, in Shakespeare. And what's interesting about it is if you look at is here, one of the things that's neat, kind of going back to they're not just four patterns, they interact in complex ways. For example, this thing is a distinction, is, the identity is, which comes from the verb to be. It's a very complex verb in the English language, maybe the most complex. And what's neat about that is that here it's a distinction, but it's acting also as a relationship, D and R. And of course, we can make that into a system, so we can go to, the, we can go to, the, um, to Webster's and look at all the parts that make up the verb to be, all the subconcepts. And so, of course, we can take some of these little guys, you know, and we can, we can put those parts into this, into this block. So again, you're seeing it's being a distinction, and it's being a relationship, and it's being a part-whole structure. And it could even be uh, an existential perspective, right? I mean, it has to do with being and existentialism. So that's kind of the idea. And then to get to your other part of your question, which is just them? visual thinking, I'm not going to discuss this. I'm just going to show you. There, there is a, a whole map, a, a whole diagramming technique that we developed that is really just analogous to the blocks except two-dimensional that we teach kids and teachers and, and adults how to do visual diagramming that's much more robust and, and not and doesn't um, isn't hindered by some of the uh, false assumptions of some of the most popular diagramming techniques out there like mind mapping which has tons of co cognitive cul-de-sacs in it for example like centralized thinking and, and tree-like structures, hierarchical categories, and things like that, that really actually get us in trouble. They think they're getting us out of, out of problems, but they kind of get us in cognitive cul-de-sacs. So I'm not gonna go too far into that, but it's, it's, that, it's the visual version of, of this. And if you want the research behind that, it's this little article kind of goes through all the different research. But I, I would add one thing, too, which is, um, you know, we spend a lot of time in classrooms, whether it's, you know, in elementary schools all the way up to universities and even some uh, corporate boardrooms. And what's remarkable about, probably you would, in, you would intuit this, is, you know, it's very easy for a child to take a physical object and, and replace it, you know, pretend that it's that idea. It takes the sort of their thinking out of their heads and into their hands. So it's very easy for kids to, to be physically shown an abstract idea like what it means to take a perspective you can, simply, you can simply illustrate this is a point, you know, and this is a view. Well, teaching something like that to young children is very difficult without the physicality ground, you know, grounded by the blocks. So we found, um, you know, to a greater degree than we probably would have expected, that just the, the nature of being able to touch and hold and manipulate and play with and interact the blocks physically really allows kids to sort of get less <coughs> entangled in their heads and start to really partition out the ideas that they were struggling with. So that's all I would add. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Do you find some people take more to the physicality and some people less? Absolutely. And then do, you have, do you have techniques for handling the people who aren't that kind of physical thinker? Abs yeah. Absolutely. The, the question is, do some students take more to the physicality uh, than others, and uh, do we have techniques, uh, you know, to, to differentiate those learners? And, and the answer is definitely yes. There, a lot of the kids that you would typically think of as troubled in school, tr not to, not troubled behaviorally, but but you struggling. know the kids that aren't that are struggling with school will really respond to the physicality of things, um, and those same kids will respond to the visual thinking, uh, you know, just the two-dimensional thing that's visual. Uh, you know, the truth of our school system is that it's, it's highly biased towards linguistic learners. And so what these kinds of things do is bring, bring in uh, those other learners that really are not doing well just because the school system was set up for them not to do well. 
They're set up, the, the, our school system's set up for readers, really. I did terrible in school. I dropped out of high school, um, and, and I hated every minute of school. And, uh, and the reason for that was that I'm not a terribly great reader. I read a lot, but I'm not a great reader. And I don't get a tremendous amount of comprehension out of reading. But show me an image, and I'll you know, never forget it. Or show me something physical, and it's just you know, instantaneous. So uh, definitely kids respond differently. But I think all kids, I mean, that's what this article in Scientific American Mind is about, is that you know, we evolved, our brain evolved connected to our hands and connected to our vision. And so when we, when we try to differentiate in fMRI the difference between visual learning, for example, and tactile learning, we actually have a very difficult time in the brain differentiating those two things because they're so, they're so intertwined together. And so the you know, thinking and the visual cortex and tactile function are all very, very related. Uh, you know, so I, you know, it's not like linguistic learners aren't good at tactile things or visual things. Mm. Yeah. I think they want you to take the mic because they're recording and then people that watch it can hear the question. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, uh, have you um, looked at the connection with emotions and the social dimensions of those four areas and how has that played out? So the social and emotional dimensions. Yes, I mean, uh, perspective taking, for example, which is one of the four patterns, is absolutely uh, basal to empathy and, and compassion. Um, if you think about mindset, uh, stereotypes, uh, yes. negotiation, uh, bias. help me out, bias, all uh, collaboration, all those things at their root is perspective taking. And although it might sound like perspective taking is one fourth of the four things, the, you know, it's what people, uh, when, the, when people first come to the DSRP, they think, oh, there, there's these four things. But what makes DSRP really work mathematically and, and sort of as a, as, a, as a rationale is the dynamics between these things and how they operate. And so the entire thing is a perspective-taking machine in a sense. And in that sense, uh, if you want to develop EQ, emotional quotient or emotional intelligence, um, DSRP can, can really uh, be core to that. A lot of the things that we find in research that help develop it are you know, part and parcel of this method. Does that answer that? Sort of. What, you want to be I mean, I'm thinking, you know, uh, it may, this, the source of a, someone having a problem with learning may be emotional, and so I'm just wondering by going through those four yeah. processes, whether that will get at someone who's angry or frustrated yeah. or uh, sad or in despair. We, we have actually, um, I see where, where you're going with that. Um, let's see if I can explain. So we actually have come across, I can give you an example of content and then broaden it out. We were working with a school actually locally that has a very high, uh, a rural school that has a very high proportion of free and reduced lunch students. And um, there was one child in an after school program, this was a, a school that uses the blocks for some of the things in the classroom around content knowledge and developing thinking skills. But um, the head of this after school program had a set of blocks with her, and she had a child who had an emotional breakdown at the time it was time to go home. And she was having a very hard time understanding what the child's emotional issues were all about. Well, the child was familiar with the blocks and was familiar with you know, being able to sort of differentiate ideas and make connections between them and take different perspectives on them. So she got the blocks out, and she said, well, you know, let's, let's pretend that this block is your feelings. You know, what, what are the parts of that feeling? And, you know, they name them, put a block in, so they concretize each one of those emotions and physically represent it with the block. And through sort of, um, we have a series of uh, questions that a lot of teachers use that are sort of like an algorithm for, you know, teaching kids to make distinctions, organize these ideas, nest and connect them with relationships and systems and take different perspectives on them. So she sort of ran through that algorithm of how kids, th this particular child had been trained to think about academic or content knowledge. And the same four step of patterns allowed this child to sort of be metacognitive about his, his emotions. And what it came down to once they sort of deconstructed all the different parts of this big box that was feelings into littler boxes into the littlest, was the child didn't want to go home because he has a miserable home life. He's happier at school. 
but had she not had some sort of a way to be sort of, to sort of train that child to be sort of take a step back and be more objective about his feelings, they might not have been able to sort of deconstruct it as sort of effectively. Does that, in, does that more along what you were asking? Yeah, it's just that. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's someone, uh, someone who's son? Okay. Uh, are you familiar with John Heron's work? Um, a, he's Heron? written a H-E-R-O-N. He wrote a book in 1992 called Feeling and Personhood, and he sort of turns cognition on its head yeah. and talks about different ways of representing learning beyond cognition. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I it's, it's sort of this notion that you don't figure out emotions through cognition. Yes. yes. I see what you're asking. Okay, so uh, this, is gonna, this, is gonna, this has to go a little deeper. Um, so DSRP is... Uh, how do I explain? So DSRP is actually not a cognitive theory. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time talking about thinking and cognition, but what, what DSRP does is actually bridge sort of what's happening biologically and physically to that psychological world and pre-linguistically. So what that means is that, um, for example, if you take Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences or if you take an, somebody who is, has intra or interpersonal intelligence, not this sort of mathematical logical intelligence, Though what those people are doing is still DSRP. They're doing it with a, with, with a sort of different approach, which is they're able to finally distinguish between emotions, for example, someone with high emotional intelligence. Or they're able to finally sort of break down and separate out their emotions, emotionally, not cognitively. And the same is true of a kinesthetic learner or an interpersonal learner. What that person is doing is making social distinctions part whole relationships, et cetera, and, and taking multiple perspectives. They're not doing that cognitively like an analytical, logical, mathematical learner. They're doing it in whatever uh, uh, multiple intelligence that they're in. So DSRP, we, when we talk about thinking, we often think cognition, and DSRP is obviously quite useful for that. But it's, but it's pre-cognitive. Uh, it's, it's essentially a, a physical theory. I mean, if you look at what DSRP says fundamentally, it's a physical theory. It talks about what, what all things in the universe do fundamentally. They, they distinguish themselves, they interrelate with each other, they form groups and coalitions, and they have a unique experience on the world that we can think of as a, as a perspective. And that, that collective of unique experiences makes up the, the reality of any network, whether it be a gene network or an atomic network or a conceptual neuronal network. I hope that maybe answers. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm not sure I've got this question fully formed, but one of the things we do in the library is help students become information literate. The idea that they think critically and find information that they're not necessarily getting all the content from their classes and they learn to find it and manage it. So anyway, I guess the question is, how do you see what you're doing fitting with the teaching of information literacy? Uh, that's a good question, partly because the, the, defini the distinction of information is so uh, sort of difficult, whether you mean you know, literally data inform inf information or whether you mean information as sort of knowledge. Yes. It, you, you're speaking of knowledge? Yes. Okay. So um, what, what we typically describe as a feedback loop of knowledge and thinking. In other words, um, a lot of people, a lot of uh, our school systems believe that you can put knowledge into kids' heads, and we know this is not true. We know, we know that it can't be done like a, like a computer can transfer files. And so the question is, how do kids actually build knowledge? What they do is they take information and they use thinking processes to structure it. And that construction is what creates knowledge. And if you look at novice expert research, the same thing applies. The construction, the organization of the information is what differentiates an expert from a novice. You could have a novice like this studies at MIT and Harvard where you have you know, physics students just graduating and they test them on certain things. And what they find is they actually have all the information. They don't have it structured right. Like they know all the information. They just don't have it structured like an expert has it structured. And so what DSRP is doing is it's showing you those complex structures 
for how you can structure information in a way that's incredibly adaptive um, so that you can utilize it in all the various ways that an expert utilizes it. And in that sense, it's, it's, it's exactly doing what I think information literacy is all about, which is you're taking information, structuring it in very dynamic ways, which is literally the construction of knowledge, transforming information into knowledge. And when you do that, you're not just information full, you're knowledge able. And I think you know, my, my shocking experience in, at, at Cornell and numerous other universities was with these incredible kids that were the cream of the crop. I mean, they came from the best. They did as well as you can do in our school system. I could give my students any test, and they could ace it. And they could even ace it very quickly, like you know, the next day or something, as long as you tell them what's on the test. And what I noticed was these students have learned how to be great at school. They're really good at school, and we're mistaking that for being knowledge able. They're not knowledge able. When they get out in the world, they're not able to solve novel problems in a, the way an expert does, which is to move things around, shift it around, and apply it, transfer you know, from a, the setting that they learned it to a, a novel setting, which is called far transfer, or horizontal, or vertical transfer. They're not able to do that. What they're able to do is be information full for a very short period of time, which we call the test, the, the week of the test. And, and when we test their test-taking abilities, we see that they're very capable of cramming for those tests, taking those tests. They're great at school. They've learned the pattern of school. They're so smart. Humans are so smart. They can learn the pattern of school and not learn anything else. So they've learned the pattern of school. And when we look at how that, that testing that they get, you know, an A or B or whatever, when we look at the degradation of that, of that information, you know, 24 hours later, we have 20, 30 percent loss. 30 days later, we have a 70, 80 percent loss. So they're memorizing that information, and we could think that that's information literacy, but I don't think that's you know, what you mean by, by information. I think what we mean by information or knowledge, what I would call knowledge, is information that's structured in a way that's very adaptable, very usable, very transferable, uh, very flexible. You know? and, and so DSRP gives you the structure. Knowledge is essentially information plus structure. DSRP is the structure that, that structures all information. It doesn't matter what topic it's in. Uh, there's a bunch of hands, sorry. I don't know which one. Whoever's, yeah, maybe you could decide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, hi, this I think is more for Laura. Um, I'm really excited by these ideas. The task in front of me right now is to design a high school curriculum to teach teenagers about the health insurance system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so we're just falling all over ourselves trying to lay out this information and make sure it's the fullest information and we explain it just right. And, but what you're saying is, if I hear it right, we should present them with some basics and a problem to solve and just let them go at it. And maybe there's some manipulatives involved in mm -hmm. this process. Um, yep. If I read your book, will I know how to? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, you can call me. You know yeah, that. <laughs> I, we know each other. Um, I mean, I think, I think, yes. I mean, there is, you're, you're running into what we were talking about, which is the danger of over-preparing to teach. So I would say give them sort of the, the big picture of what they need to know and pose some sort of interesting, meaty kind of question and give them a couple of different tools to use what you really want them to do is understand both the content and how to structure it to form an understanding, build an understanding of the, the healthcare system. So, you know, for certain kinds of students, you might find that having physical, tangible objects that they can draw on and organize just as they would, you know, on paper will work. Also, you can have them diagram things out, um, you know, in whichever way works for them is the way to do it. But I, I think, yes, you're right. I think. We often think that we need to give them everything they need to know and sort of just lead them to the very edge of the place that they need to drink from and say, okay, now sip. But what you really need to do is just push them in, let them try to swim, find their way out and build it, let it get messy, let it get scary even. And they'll actually, by building that meaning through the content and the structure, they'll actually retain it and understand it much more deeply. So, yeah. And about the book, if you read the book, you'll, you know, you'll get started on it. The book is not a download. But you know? we're local. But we're local, number one. <laughs> and number two, we have a, a Facebook community 
and there's tons of teachers sharing their lessons mm -hmm. and their diagrams. So you know that one of the best ways to learn it, aside from like reading, is to is to look at what other teachers are doing in, in even other subjects. It doesn't matter what subject or what grade. You'll see how they use those structures, and you can use it literally in your in your health health insurance uh, co constructions. And, and call us obviously. And put and push through the resistance. <laughs> you'll get to use to using a tactile manipulator with older students. They will at first push back because they don't want to be treated like kindergartners. But just, you know, have them free form experiment. Just let them play. They'll, they'll find the blocks very engaging and they'll, they'll get into it after a while. But we do find that older students sometimes have a little bit, and faculty yes. sometimes resist to tactile. But to be clear, you don't need the blocks no. to do the thinking skills. I mean, the we can blocks just are just diagram. one uh, method. I think there was another, there's one behind the post that you can't see. So did, does this model allow for um, temporal progression? And where I'm going with this is, so I'm from the communication school, and one of these big ideas is that we learn through narrative, through storytelling. Yeah. That's how I s see the world. Yeah. And, and the storytelling is sort of built very differently. It's also, it's very linguistic. Yeah. Can these manipulatives, or what's, maybe I should say from a perspective, what's the relationship between narrative and building and looking at concepts? That's a great question. The, the, uh, the SRP is pre-linguistic. Um, and what I mean by that is, is it's prior to all languages. Studies that have been done in anthropology on tribes finds uh, the DSRP structures, regardless of whether you're from a little tribe in the Amazon or whether you're from you know, a Western civilized nation or whatever. So um, as a result, these cognitive structures lead to linguistics. It's like saying that physics leads to chemistry, and chemistry leads to biology. I mean, biology can't violate the laws of chemistry, and chemistry not physics, and et cetera. And linguistics doesn't violate the laws of cognition, because cognition came before language. Um, so, and, and emotion came you know, before cognition. So it, doesn't, it, it correlates with that as well. So, um, it absolutely works with linguistics. It's, it is behind the linguistic structure. And we have, again, on Facebook, they just had a teacher post a bunch of stuff on deconstructing narratives and deconstructing stories and fiction and a million other different lessons on, on exactly this. So I would you know, go there and, and then email us, and I'll, we'll send you other stuff on how to do it with narratives or something. No more time, huh? Okay. Uh, one, more, one more question. Sure. Oh, um, I mean, you talked a lot about the problems with the educational system not teaching yeah. thinking skills and how it's not preparing kids for, their, for the real world and the jobs they'll be having. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, because of the way it's set up, you wouldn't expect to see necessarily that much effect in the grades um, after, your, after you introduce this sort of system. Have you looked at how it in, the impact on problem solving or eventually life outcomes that you would be hoping to. I know it, you just started doing it, so you wouldn't have that sort of data yet. But yeah, we don't have any longitudinal data. Quite but I was just yet. wondering if, you're like, in, in improvements in problem solving abilities yeah. or that sort of thing, you'd be hoping to see. We have we have a lot of um, you know as you begin any sort of large scale research, uh, you start with sort of qualitative case study narrative kind of stuff, and we have a lot of that. Um, across geographic locations, different kinds of teachers, different kinds of districts, dis different grades, different subjects. And what we're finding, and we're, we're actually starting a wide-scale sort of analysis of that qualitative data to find those, those common categorical themes for you. Um, and what we're finding is that teachers, um, regardless if it's in a special needs classroom, a kindergarten classroom, a high school, are seeing that when you are teaching the curriculum, the content of any subject, in parallel with, with the language and developing these thinking skills, you find that um, students are, are much more um, easily transferring that knowledge from, say, something they learn in math to something they learn in history, because they're, they're recognizing the underlying structure and the content in both subject areas. Even things like we had a pre-K classroom, one of our very first classrooms um, that really had a teacher that just championed this and jumped in and has taught everything in parallel with thinking skills. She's found, um, she had the youngest classroom she's had, which were three and four year olds in pre-K Head Start down in Virginia. And the outcomes that these, these children had by the end of the year 
were so markedly different. They had, they had, met, they had met all of the pre-K benchmarks, and something like 89% of them had met the kindergarten benchmarks, which was hugely problematic. So the, pr the principal actually had to find a kindergarten teacher, get her sort of immersed and trained in how to keep teaching in this method so that that cohort of students you know, would not go to kindergarten and be totally bored, disengaged, and not still be able to transfer that knowledge. I mean, we've even had in special needs classroom where a teacher introduced just the concept of part whole abstractly using the blocks and then came back on a Monday and taught part whole structure in content and the kids remembered the lesson from Friday which for that particular classroom was pretty remarkable something she had never seen so the, the short answer is we have a lot of case study data that we're analyzing we have it's very hard, as you know, to um, go through human subjects when you're working with children. So we're now working with you know, different departments of accountability and different districts to really correlate teacher practice and the outcomes on state tests, which based on this preliminary data show that the, the test scores are also going up quite significantly. So it all takes time, but we'll get there. Okay, I guess we better stop there, but let's thank our speakers. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.